I'm here to introduce my firm, and I also want to introduce um, people from my firm who are sitting in the audience. Um, Forbes, Lipschitz, um, Helena Steiner, Jesse. Um, Jesse is over here, uh, Calano, and I don't know if Young Kim is also here, but, um, and uh, Carissa Azar. Um, because uh, my firm is really all about teamwork, and it's about the collaboration um, that we enjoy, this um, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, we're really trying to establish a new paradigm of practice, um, and that involves um, thinking about community, economy, infrastructure, water, climate, and, and ecology. And um, it really relates to something that Rene DeBose, um, his humanistic philosophy, espouses that um, global problems are actually conditioned by local circumstance and choices. And that's something that I think you'll see reflected in the work tonight. Um, so a lot of the work you'll see um, is centered on ideas about infrastructure. And infrastructure developed as a term um, in the World War II era in reference to military logistical operations but we see it in a different light. We want to look at how transportation systems or infrastructure systems can be used to sort of enable other opportunities. <clears throat> And this is a paradigm of a project um, looking at how those systems might be changed um, for a site in Montreal or for the city of Montreal. So in this case, we're using infrastructure systems to re-stitch a city back together. Um, and you know, we do this in our practice um, by using pilots and by using grants. And I think that's what, what's one of the thing, or is one of the things that differentiates DLAN from sort of uh, from other uh, other practices, um, because we we go into communities and we work with community organizations and. We, we, find, we find grant money, um, and we help to connect those organizations and those communities with these larger granting sources. So the New York State Council on the Arts has also been a, a funding source to, to deland in our projects, as has um, this array, uh, array of, of different funders from NOAA to the National Fish and Wildlife Federation to the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, the Graham Foundation, the, the DOT, DEP, the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, among others. Um, and uh, one of the, the places that we're operating, as the, the previous um, video suggests, is on roads and, and watersheds. And it's interesting to start, start to look at the relationship between these roads and watersheds. Um, there are 772 cities um, in the U.S. that have combined sewer systems. And what that means is that the stormwater that's going over all of those roads is actually combining with the sanitary sewage and it's pouring into our water bodies. And this is a, a big problem. And those 772 cities are now coming under federal, sort of, uh, uh, federal eye. Um, for having to comply with uh, Clean Water Act standards. And so it's going to be an ongoing issue where these cities are going to have to clean up this, these waters. Um, in New York City, for instance, um, 
gosh, what is it? It's like 400 million gallons of combined sewage effluent go into the harbor every week, and I think that it comes to um, 20 trillion gallons a year of this combined sewage effluent. And so we'll show you some examples of what that leads to um, in the Gowanus Canal. Um, in the Gowanus, we designed a park that we call the Gowanus Canal Sponge Park, and we did that because um, we're trying to add permeable open space around the Gowanus Canal area. And the basic concept of the idea is that wetlands act like sponges. So we want to start to use these sponge parks or this permeable open space to actually absorb that surface water runoff. Now, Gowanus is a tricky place because it's already a wetland, but you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you have property that's fairly close to the canal and your basement floods all the time. But you can see that it used to be a swamp. In 1776, um, the whole area was marshy. And all of that water has been contained and managed and, and sublimated, but it really likes to emerge um, occasionally um, uh, to, uh, to the detriment of a lot of the people that live there. Um, and so we tried to map, well, we, we mapped the, um, the watershed and the sewer shed of the area to determine what the inputs were to this area of operation um, outlined in yellow. Um, the Gowanus is, uh, you know, it's a decaying post-industrial waterfront, but at the same time, this waterfront site is used by the Gowanus Canal um, Dredgers Boat Club for their canoeing and kayaking. Um, they operate it out of that, that shipping container behind the graffiti-covered um, wall. Um, but you can see that the area um, does experience a lot of surface water runoff. There isn't a lot of um, permeable ground, and that surface water carries with it uh, a lot of dirt and detritus and oil and, and uh, toxic chemicals. Now this is what I meant by the combined sewer overflows. If you look over um, to your left, that's actually raw sewage that's sitting on the top of the Gowanus Canal, sort of held back um, by that, that yellow sort of baffle. Um, so we're trying to, to sort of break down the problem um, because you know, people have been looking at the Gowanus for a long time. And I think that it, it's really, it's a very complex place and you need to start, start to break down the issues, the hydrology, the ecology, the land use, the cultural preservation. Think about how the um, street runoff is leading to those CSOs. Think about um, the contaminated water leading to poor animal habitat. And then there are also, there's a lot of privately owned land that abuts the, the canal. So um, um, that's an issue as we're moving forward. And then also there's a, a lack of maintenance to the area. And, um, and as you can see from this list of, of toxins, it's actually quite dangerous because of all the, the, um, the different things that are in the water. So what we're trying to do is actually start to engage these issues and think about how design might help to improve the area, how we might um, think about historic preservation of some of the cultural resources in the area, how we might change land use and add program, add dog runs and community centers and, um, and, and arts facilities, how we might improve habitat um, with our sponge parks, how we might um, start to clean up a lot of these um, toxins, pull them out of that water uh, with uh, phytoremediative techniques. Um, and so we, we started again, we went back to our mapping um, and thinking about where the, the sewer outfalls were and where the pump stations were. Um, and where there were areas of direct drainage. And then thinking about places where um, there was street level water infiltration opportunities, places where we could actually trap that water um, away from, or up, upland of the canal. And then also ideas about a stormwater irrigation esplanade, sort of taking some of the water to a, an esplanade along the edge of the canal. So we developed these sections and tried to think about how we might actually stack um, a, a, a program space over an ecological space, trying to maximize the value of that landscape um, for both people and plants. And this is um, an example of how that works with the, uh, the walkway actually going out over these, these wetland areas. Um, it's, you know, city planning was in the process of doing a rezoning when we worked on this initially, uh, this master plan, and um, they drew this green line around the canal, which is lovely, sure, esplanade around the canal. But the problem is that there are a lot of privately owned buildings that abut the water. And you can see the black zones are places where those, those landowners um, aren't, aren't going to um, basically give up their land or, or tear down their buildings in order to um, put in that lovely green esplanade. And because of jurisdictional issues um, with the state DEC, it's not like you can actually build out over the water. 
So we came up with the idea of creating an urban promenade or really engaging the entire district as a new open space and thinking about how these pathways might at some points be along the water, but at some points might sort of uh, circle back into the community. So it's actually an economic uh, vehicle for improving the entire neighborhood. So this is um, the Sponge Park entrance at 3rd Street. Some of the funding for this project actually came from Nydia Velasquez, um, who's our congresswoman, and her husband uh, proposed to her on the banks of the Guanas Canal, so we made this, this in her honor. Um, um, and here you can see the master plan um, the, of how those pathways actually weave back into the neighborhood. We tried to look for opportunities um, where private development could occur or was occurring, and then also places where there was city-owned land that we could use for, um, for new development of open space. Um, there are cultural redevelopment areas um, that are um, potential, a great potential in the area. Um, and then also there were some ideas about creating floating wetlands in the future to actually help to clean the water that's, um, that's in the canal. Now, in the middle of doing all of this work, it was designated an EPA Superfund site. And, you know, it was complicated before, um, jurisdictionally, but it got even more complicated with the, the Superfund. Um, the, the red actually shows the extent of the, um, of the toxins. Basically, it's, it's like oil, tar, um, underneath the, this whole area. And you can imagine a swamp, how, how that is actually moving around. Um, but uh, this is probably... I don't know, I can't say it's my favorite diagram because I have to live it, um, but it, it demonstrates what it's like to do a project in New York City, especially a waterfront project in New York City. And I wanna just point out some things, like the, the, the sediment underneath the canal is actually controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers, although now that's actually controlled by the EPA Superfund people. The water in the canal is a navigable waterway, so you have to get, um, uh, uh, um, Army Corps of Engineers permits for that. The shade over the water is Department of Environmental Conservation. The area is a brownfield in addition to being a, um, an EPA Superfund site. So the first five feet of sediment underneath the road um, is in the jurisdiction of the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is the state agency. But the surface of the road is actually controlled by the Department of Transportation, the city agency. And then the water that's running over the road is the Department of Environmental Protection, which is the city agency. And then the green, the green is the Parks Department, and they care about every plant that's planted in there, um, and whether it's native. Actually, now city council also cares about whether plants are native um, because they have such great expertise in landscape architecture. Um, so um, it's really interesting sort of how this whole group um, starts to get involved in this, you know, this, this project. Um, and, you know, I've only named a, a few. There are 200 potential permits that you'd have to get for this one, for one little street end project. Um, so it's, it's complicated, but we're charging ahead. We're doing our first pilot. We've gotten funding from city council um, and from Nydia Velasquez and from the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Um, so we looked for our first place to start. And what we did was we actually calculated the amount of water that was flowing down these streets and tried to figure out which was the best one, best place to start. So we picked the worst case scenario um, on 2nd Street and we're designing for a 1.2 inch storm. And what that means is that, that every storm, well 90% of all storms last year were under 1.2 inches. And this is a state standard that you design for. So there were like 100 storms, so um, you know, there were 10 of them that, that were above 1.2 inches, including Sandy, right? Um, so now I'm going to show you how this works. So basically what happens is the water um, comes down to the end of the street and it flows into um, these cells. What we've done is we've break it, broken up the, the um, sponge park into a modular construction so it can be replicated um, in other areas around the canal. The, um, these cells, um, there's, you know, there, there are a number of these cells going across the um, across the, the road bed at the end of the, of, at the street end. And there's also a sedimentation basin, um, basically um, upland of that, um, that will take out the cigarette butts and a lot of the detritus before it can get into the sponge park. There are, um, are scuppers that actually help to um, dissipate the water uh, throughout the, the system. Um, and then there's actually an integrated sand filter that's underneath that walkway. So there are um, 7,200 uh, 7, miles of bridges and elevated highways that run through U.S. cities. 
So this actually is a, a sort of offshoot of our sponge park project. We're looking at the stormwater that's actually coming off the highways and um, trying to trap that and use it. Um, what we want to do is we want to capture it um, in a series of, of uh, what we called holds systems um, that will hold the water um, and allow plants to grow and um, help to either infiltrate or evapotranspirate that water so that it doesn't enter the combined sewer system. We're working on two sites, again with grants from, um, in this case, the Department of Environmental Protection and uh, NOAA, um, a site out in, in, uh, in Flushing Meadows um, and then a site up in the Bronx on the Harlem River. Um, and we're looking at different prototypes. The idea is that this can be something that's made as a system, that um, it can then be replicated across the country it, for those 772 cities that have these combined sewer overflow problems. Um, so we're doing an in-ground system that we're testing now. This is actually in construction and should be up and running um, you know, by the end of the planting season in June. Um, and then we have an above ground system that we're designing for the, the Bronx site because there we, we think it might be a brown field, we're not sure, um, but we were allowed by the Parks Department to actually work on top of their property. And so we're actually designing this one out of Jersey barriers, so it's a real, it's a serious pop-up. And this one is so large because we're going to hold all of the water on the site and allow it all to evapotranspirate. We're not going to actually have any drainage into the ground on this one or any drain um, going out of, the, out of the system. So there are 35 million US residents that live within 100 meters of a four-lane highway. My vision when I started the firm was to work on these infrastructure systems, and I started looking at the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And this was done through a grant from the New York State Council on the Arts. Um, and I, I looked at the BQE in uh, Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens. Um, and you can see that's the section um, highlighted on the, on the bottom of the slide. Um, we then subsequently were hired by, or, or got through an RFP, um, got a job to look at um, a section of the BQE up in Williamsburg. Um, the demographics of the two sites are very interesting because in the southern site, um, there's a population of about 100,000 people and the, de and the median household income is about 80,000. Um, and the cost of decking that section of the trench um, is about a billion dollars. Um, and in the northern site, we have 160,000 people and a median household income of about $40,000. Um, and the cost of decking this part is about $100 million. The area to the north was downzoned by city planning. The area to the south, you know, city planning was very eager to actually do this capping project um, as a potential uh, real estate development project back before 2008. So, so Robert Moses, um, you know, proposed these beautiful verdant highways um, or parkways um, through these neighborhoods, um, and uh, uh, and you know what he really delivered though was was this, um, and uh, you know the six lane highway trench um, that's running through this neighborhood. You know, he plowed through those brownstone neighborhoods, and he created a physical boundary. And he really also created a great amount of economic disparity between two sites. There are also um, territories that have developed in the Williamsburg site where the Dominican gangs are on one side and the Puerto Rican gangs are on the other side and the, the trench actually forms the, the, you know, the barrier in between or the, the turf. Uh, there are public health issues that we've been looking at in relation to this, trying to find correlations with asthma rates um, and obesity and physical activity levels. Um, and then we also just were looking at um, Plan YC and how these two sites actually relate to Plan YC. And one of the issues that was outlined in that study, which was really smart, was you know there should be um, everyone should have a park within a 10-minute walk of their house. And so what we recognized was that on the Carroll Garden site, um, you know there's this hole in the middle, so there's there's a real need for a park, but that site's really expensive, and it's also a site that has Brooklyn Bridge Park, which was, which was just developed. And so, you know, it, it needs it, but, but the, the Williamsburg site actually has tot lots that are right next to the trench, and schools that are right next to the trench, um, which is a bit of a problem, um, but they don't have any active recreation space. So the kids that are most vulnerable to getting involved with the gangs are kind of left out at their own devices. 
Um, and so what we want to do and what the community really wanted was to actually start to think about how we'd make new space for them. So we started to pull it apart again and analyze it. Um, we looked at the trench as a barrier and thought about the physical properties and then thought about how um, there sort of criteria. There are, you know, there's pedestrian circulation, health and safety, vehicular circulation, recreation, environmental benefit, and development. And all of those things come together to make like a, a good city, right? So, so we thought about the existing conditions of the BQE trench and how right now the car gets all the goodies, right? You know, their, their wheel is all filled out, but no, none of the other wheels are filled out. So we started to break down the, that space and think about how we might start to augment some of those other elements in the wheel and make it more valuable to everyone. Um, so ideally, what we see is the advantage here is that if we put a park over the site, you know, we increase the development opportunities, we increase public health, we increase recreation opportunities, we, we add green, certainly. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a better way of living in the city and it has a lot of value. So in the near term, we envisioned that you could add a lot of trees and potentially green walls. Um, and then in the longer term, um, actually do this capping. So in the, the Williamsburg site, which I said is, you know, it's smaller, it's a more manageable project. Um, we were hired to do a feasibility study of how we'd actually do this project. Um, and again, we went back to the section and thinking in section. Um, the highways are currently not uh, at, at um, federal highway standards. And so what we recognized was that we would need to, with any new kind of intervention, actually uh, maintain or create a 16, 16 feet of clearance underneath the existing bridges um, in order to make our cap. We also realized that the deck had to be fairly thin um, so that it, um, we could get that clearance. And so actually the great thing about that, well, we, we, we recognized that there were we're cutting off the top. Um, recognized that there were um, three sites where it was actually uh, feasible to cap the, the trench, and then one site where it was just going to be too expensive um, to figure out the engineering. And so the community really wanted to have active open space, and that was actually really great in relation to needing this thin deck, because what we proposed was to put um, a field turf uh, topping. Um, in the center portion for um, active recreation and then put the trees and the, the sort of denser real landscape um, on the sides, the passive landscape on the sides um, for this vision of, of a new BQ green. So now I, I, it's, it's great to sort of dream about you know, capping highways and sure, yeah, we could do that if we had all the money in the world. But I think there's actually a, a way to do this. Um, and and the structure, I think, is really interesting because these bridges are 50 years old and these bridges need to be replaced. Um, these bridges will cost about $10 million a piece to replace. So that's something that the city has to spend money on. The, there are HUD community redevelopment grants and you know, the sort of next generation of ICE-T grants um, that, that are, are partnerships between HUD and DOT. So what we're trying to do now is engage the Department of Transportation to take this on to get a federal match um, to pay for basically filling in the space in between. So you'd have this incredible sort of leverage of money that you have to spend already against a, a, federal, um, um, a federal grant um, to pay for something that could really help these 160,000 voters. So this right now it's a space for cars and we really wanted to make it a space for people. It's really passive, um, you know, there's no one there. Sometimes there are drug dealers there people sleeping. Um, and we want to turn that into an active open space. And this really limited use handball court, we want to turn into a community center um, with a pool and daycare and, and really make it a space for the community. So the, the economics of these, these trenches are actually really interesting to look at. I talked sort of big picture um, in relation to how we fund that, that project. But, but even planting 350 trees on this site could have a huge impact. Um, we uh, looked at this um, Forest Service document, um, this like big thick tome, um, and turned it into this one page diagram um, suggesting that um, in one year, 350 trees will generate $250,000 worth of oxygen, provide almost a half a million dollars in pollution control, recycle almost $300,000 in water, 
or of water, um, contribute almost $4 million in shade value um, for a 10-year gain of $50 million. Now, that's not a gain that any one individual um, gets to hold, but it's a, an economic gain for the city and for our community. So 40% um, of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a coast, and we certainly experienced that this year. Um, 19 million people live in the New York City metropolitan area. And as Adam suggested, I'm, I'm going to talk now about, um, about the MoMA Rising Currents um, project where we collaborated with ARO on an analysis of how we might develop some strategies for how to deal with um, periodic um, inundation from climate change impacts in lower Manhattan. We really need to prepare because um, scientists project we're going to have a six foot sea level rise over the next 80 years. Um, and you can see the, the potential impact that that might, might cause. Um, our team, Team Zero, looked at this area of lower Manhattan. Um, it's, oops, I'm missing a slide. I'm missing a slide. Well, you don't get to see 1650, but, um, but a long time ago. Um, <laughs> um, the edge of Manhattan um, used to be much smaller, and there were very gentle sort of edges um, reaching out to the, the sea. Um, by, uh, by 1850, um, you can see that there's a, a, a more hardened edge um, along, the, uh, uh, along the perimeter to facilitate shipping. Um, there were actually slips cut into the edge of the city to allow the boats to actually get up to the, the water's edge. Um, so, and then by, um, by 1960, um, we had this, uh, these finger piers um, to facilitate even larger boats. But by 1960, I mean, sorry, by 19, well, by now, um, the, the shipping had left and gone out to more remote areas where there was access to trucks and, and because of containerized shipping. Um, and we ended up with this disconnected morphology because we have this recreational edge surrounding the city. Um, and what we're really looking at is a value at risk. Um, with the, the sea level rise of six feet, you can see that this whole outer area um, would be inundated. And with an 18-foot Category 2 storm surge, um, you'd have water going up to that, that um, dotted red line in the upland areas. And that's really what happened um, with Sandy this year. Um, and so it's funny because Irene, Irene um, dumped a lot of water and Sandy had a lot of waves. Um, and so our system is actually trying to deal with, with both. Um, we're looking at the upland flows um, that I talked about and was dealing with in, in Sponge Park, um, and then the potential for this water coming in from the ocean through higher tides and storm surges. So the ex our proposal is, um, this is the existing seawall, and this is the existing seawall in 2100 if we don't do anything. And then this is our, our category two storm inundation um, area. There are also combined sewer overflows in Manhattan, and you can see this is the location of those overflows. So really what we're proposing is to allow the water to come in, but then to get it out really quickly. Um, and we're doing that through a, a sort of a, a range, a range of um, porous green streets. We have streets that can take um, sort of normal rain. Um, we have streets that can take a lot of rain and channel it into these sponge slips. And then we have streets that are around the perimeter that can actually take the large waves and then take it out, kind of in the way that the, the tunnels did, only it would be intentional here. Um, um, but, but really what we need to do first is actually raise the edge of Lower Manhattan um, by six feet with this new hardened edge. But we didn't want to just raise it the way it's always been raised. We wanted to create a different kind of pattern, this kind of crenellated edge along um, along the, the Hudson River um, and then actually move, move the, uh, the city out a bit on the, the East River to make this new resilient system. Within this new resilient system, there are upland uh, recreational spaces, there are freshwater wetlands, and there are um, salt marshes. There's also a series of barrier islands along uh, the southern tip of Manhattan um, to break the, the force of those waves and dissipate it. Um, and then, but you notice that there are places where we still allowed for boat access. It can't just be all, you know, green fuzzy edge. 
you have to be thinking about all the different factors that make a good city. Um, so within this adapted infrastructure in the upland areas, uh, we actually designed, redesigned the street. Um, right now, you, know, you have your sewer mains and your water mains and um, all of your fiber optic uh, cables and uh, the gas lines, they're all running underneath the street. And so what we proposed was to take those systems and put them underneath the sidewalks in waterproof vaults. Um, that would protect them from periodic inundation from salt water. Um, and then also to make them accessible, we'd put hatches in the sidewalk so that you could get in to, to them if, if they broke or if they became obsolete or needed to be repaired. Um, and what that did was it actually released the street to become a permeable open space. All the water, the surface water runoff, could actually drain through the streets um, like a sponge. So on the, the Hudson River edge, going back to the edge condition, um, we, uh, we proposed um, this, this new kind of space um, that would balance landscape and urbanity. And the idea here was that you could have new, like a new urban pattern going all the way up the west side, but you'd allow these, these wetland spaces and these boat spaces to kind of weave into the city. So it's really a, a different paradigm for how you'd experience the city. Um, and then over on the, the east side, um, we thought about how these sponge slips might actually take the, the water um, in an extreme event um, out to the water's edge. The, uh, the sponge slips are filled with plants that can um, withstand periodic inundation from salt water. So for instance, this is a sassafras and it's rosa rugosa and you know, a lot of plants that are actually kind of designed or they've, they've adapted um, to this kind of an ecosystem. And then um, the, on the east side, also thinking about a different kind of way of occupying uh, the city with this urban esker. It's actually kind of a large um, mound space. Eskers are geologic formations that happened when the, the glaciers retreated. There were these kind of snake-like mounds of sand that were left behind. So our idea was to adapt that to create this, this formation. Um, that would help to protect the city. And it's not just a big pile of sand, it's actually a living, growing thing um, that has um, walkways so that you can actually occupy it and have it become part of your urban experience. So we recognized after the, the MoMA project that this wasn't just a New York City problem, it's a global problem. Um, this map actually shows the, um, the, hurricane, the paths of hurricanes um, throughout the, the world. And you know, with that global problem, there are huge economic risks. And traditional methods of gray engineering, you know, they, they work until they don't. Um, and that's the problem. They're not living, breathing things. They can't adapt. And so our idea was to start to develop new ecologies that can be protective ecologies. We can use reef ecologies. We can think about how mangrove ecologies can be reestablished and also how mar maritime forest ecologies can be used. Um, and then thought about how those systems might, those ecological systems might relate to urban systems of industry, finance, agriculture, um, and informal settlement, and how those might actually relate to specific sites around the world. This is the, the Navy Yard. Um, we're in uh, Shanghai, uh, the Nile River Delta, and uh, in Karachi, Pakistan. Um, and then I, I want to focus also on the tourist economy. Um, this is Miami, and Miami is pretty interesting because it is an area that's at high risk, and it's also a fairly mobile uh, population because they're used to getting hit by hurricanes all the time. They know how to prepare. But, but one of the things that we noticed was that within this tourist economy, there are these, um, these landscape opportunities. Um, there are all these hotels that exist along the, the beach um, that are set back and there's a lawn and then there's a big beach and you can't actually see the water from the street. And so we wondered why it had to be a lawn in front of the hotel instead of something that was a more interesting and more productive kind of landscape. And so we designed um, this new prototype section that could bring back some of those mangrove ecologies to protect some of the upland spaces. So, you know, it's actually, it has a lot of different elements. We, we mounded the, the beach, beach area, we created a, a kind of building berm to make a more active um, urban edge uh, along the street with the hotels, um, and thought about how you might actually have a floodgate that you've closed occasionally. 
Um, so it was a, a, a different kind of model for this tourist economy. Um, and then something I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, particularly since Sandy, is, um, is sort of our strategies for how we adapt. Um, you know, the governor is now saying that, that we should buy out properties on the waterfront or that they will provide money to buy out properties on the waterfront. Um, the mayor is saying, no, 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 we have to stay. You know, we're going we're gonna to just change the architecture. And I guess what I've been thinking is that in some places we, we probably do want to retreat and that there isn't just going to be an endless flow of money to facilitate that retreat. So we need to think of a mechanism for how to make that happen. Um, and so this map shows property values in New York City. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, because of course, you know, Manhattan's very red, high value. Um, but you can see there's some blue areas that are actually also in um, like zone C in, on high ground that could become an opportunity. So what we want to do, or what I'm proposing, and this is all very new, nobody's seen this yet, um, is to start to think about a transfer of development rights. Like think about the, the potential for um, having increased FAR in the high areas um, in exchange for you know, basically a buyout of the low-lying areas. So then you could actually even pay market price for the buyout of a lot of those coastal zones where we probably shouldn't be rebuilding. So here to just you know, make that really clear, um, you, know, you build up, you get the money, the developers get the money um, in the zone C areas to buy out the people in the zone A areas, and then we can build more of this wetland edge that can help protect our city. So looking at a more specific example, um, if you have a, 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 a building that's in a zone A area in an industrial district, right now, you know, a lot of them aren't even built out to their full FAR. Um, but the idea is that you could take the FAR from part of their site even and transfer it even on site somewhere else. Or you could transfer it on site or you could transfer it elsewhere and build this more resilient edge. So here, showing how that zone A land might actually be this upland FAR, even within a mercantile, I mean, a, a, a manufacturing district. And how that might sort of change, change our, our resilience to, uh, to these climate change impacts. But, uh, but I just want to, um, to end with this slide to suggest that um, we really need to be thinking about kind of a vision um, for the future that is a, a real, a, a serious rethinking of our ecological in infrastructure. And somehow we have to be figuring out the, the methods for making this happen. And we have to try to get through all of the sort of jurisdictional roadblocks that have traditionally sort of thwarted these efforts and really make change because we can't afford not to. So thank you.